Welcome to our co-fireside chat with Komodo, featuring Mark Bloom, who's the founder of Komodo, and myself, Tamsin Leger, and I founded the Ethical Fashion Forum way back in 2006, and then Common Objective in 2016, and we launched in 2018. So today we're going to be hearing the inside story from Mark about the Komodo clothing brands, which launched way back in 1988. Um, it's seen by many as the original ethical fashion brand. So Mark, you began before sustainable fashion was really a thing and you've navigated huge changes in the fashion industry. And over 34 years, you've stayed relevant with the product, grown the business and had a huge positive footprint, both for people behind the product and for the planet. Some really impressive things have come out of your work over the last 30 or so years. And it seems you've had fun doing it, which I think is so important. If just looking at some of the comments we've had on the chat, people sharing their questions and through um, asking when they signed up to this session, people saying, you know, I'm tearing my hair out. How do you do this? So hopefully you can help some of those. Um, and I'm also, right. you know, the life is too short not to enjoy this journey. And a fashion industry made up of more businesses like Komodo could transform livelihoods for millions of people. And in this session, we're gonna deep dive into your story and how you've achieved impact and hopefully offer a few nuggets of gold to our listeners on how they can do the same. So handing over to you, where did it all begin? Uh, gosh, well, um, it has, there, there are different beginning points, really. I mean, we, we, we talk about 88 and, and, and that's the sort of date that we put on the thing, because that's when I um, went back to Bali and started making uh, surf shorts to start with. And we changed the name to Komodo, which seemed to fit much better with the revolution that was really going on in England at the time. Um, because we really coincided with uh, this new music and new club scene. And as I say, I, I always call it a social revolution that was acid house music and, and hand in hand with it was smiley culture streetwear because the smiley t-shirts um, were one of the signatures of the early of the early days of that but really my story goes back further than that um i actually started the business in london making clothes in the east end in 1986 and the first thing that um we ever made was a jean jacket made up of old patch patched up old jeans and at the time it was called a patchwork jean jacket or it was called you know there was no such word as uh, recycle or upcycle or anything like that. It was just a patchwork jacket uh, with sort of hippie connotations because that's, you know, it, it harks back, I suppose, to a 60s kind of look. Um, and that was where my business began. That's where I started, you know, making things, fight, you know, in a factory in the East End of in, in Shoreditch, which was a derelict, burnt out you know semi-occupied land um and um that was the beginning of the business but really before that before I did any of that I was a backpacker um by accident not really by plan but I ended up getting some lousy A-level results didn't fancy university anyway would have had to come back and retake my exams and definitely didn't fancy any of that and found myself uh in Asia to ostensibly to visit a friend um, and decided to turn, you know, decided it was a holiday I didn't really want to, to end. And so became a, a, a discovered backpacking really whilst I was there. And for two and a half years, you know, wandering around in Asia before I came home. And obviously I had to, I took various jobs along the way to keep me going. And, and one of the things that I did always put a little money aside for not for any I don't know why I did it I don't know I don't know why I did it but I just bought things you know you you you, you know you're traveling in these countries and you find amazing stuff in the markets and you know you just like wow it's amazing and everything was so cheap and like oh, I just, you know so I just started stuffing buying stuff and you know when I had too much I'd pack it into a trunk and send it home 
And um, I, I, I suppose why I did it, you know, I had an idea like, uh, you know, I'll get, get a stall in Camden Market and sell it when I get home. And that was really the beginning of, I suppose, you know, what I, you know, how things evolved. I, I, you have to go back to that for me in my story to explain like how on earth did I end up in Bali and Kathmandu, you know, running a business that we're still running 36, seven, you know, years later um, was, was from that. So I, you know, I, I really, you know, always want to credit the amazing places that I went to and found in the early eighties when I was traveling around as a very green teenager um, with very little experience of the world, but just kind of wide eyed at all the stuff that I found and the people I met. Um, and, and yeah, this kind of view, like, well, you know, I was born and grown up in London and Camden market is a big, you know, place for teenagers. And, you know, I just thought, Oh, I could sell this stuff on a stall in Camden market. I'd never done it before. I had no idea really how I was going to do it, but I just, that was an excuse to just buy all this stuff. So I did. And that's how we began. So that was that was uh, the beginning of my story, if you like. And then uh, when 88 came along uh, and my jean jackets made in the East End of London had kind of been copied by everybody. You know, there were so many copies out there. The whole thing was falling apart and dying. And I was really kind of left with very, you know, desperately needing, a, uh, you know, a new trick. I was a bit of a one trick pony and uh, needed something new. And um, my sister, who's two years my junior, had followed some of my footsteps and been in Bali. And, and I had a shop at the time. I'd opened a little shop in Chapel Market in Islington. And I, she knew that. She didn't know much else. There wasn't much communication in those days when you were far away. And she just sent me a little a box, a smallish box with maybe 20 or 30 things in it from Bali. Most and the box just arrived three months later because it came by post and it just arrived at the right time with the right looks of things in it that just made us go whoa let's go and, let's go let's go and get this stuff and that's what we did I got the box on the Friday afternoon I bought an airplane ticket on the Saturday morning and flew on the Sunday morning and got back to Bali and started all over again and it was a whole new beginning so we came with a new you know a new name, the name of my, my original company, which is still going, is called the Yakit Racket, which is named after the yaks of Nepal and Tibet. And um, and going to Bali and starting with fluorescent surf shorts for the smiley cultured acid house crowds, that, didn't, that name didn't really seem to fit very well. So I remembered the Komodo dragon that had once tried to eat me as I was traveling, backpacking my way through Indonesia and visited Komodo Island back in 1984. And um, that young dragon stuck in my mind and she, uh, she left an indelible mark and I decided that would be a good name <laughs> for, a new, for our new venture. And off we went. There you go, does that cover it? <laughs> amazing i mean it's it's, it's no, don't all fashion companies start that way well yeah i was gonna say it's a pretty common story um <laughs> but what's unusual is to make it a continued success and manage to get beyond that market stall and keep it going i mean yeah. just diving into that what what do you think were the key milestones that helped you to stay relevant and and grow and what what is it that's driven you what drives you to keep doing that to keep at it um i think it probably the biggest driver is kind of the, the fear of, of normal life and having to get a proper job and you know how how to i don't know it, it it's your thing you know when it's yours and you've started it it's your baby and you of course you care for it you love it you want it to you know do well and you're you know you're definitely prepared to sacrifice things and you definitely should you know yeah you so you've got you've got to find a way you know you've got to find a way and when things are going badly and and they have done on frequent occasions um how to survive you know is a is a you've got to be good at counting you've got to you've got to see you know okay it's going badly like how badly you know how okay how long can i survive like this what do I have to get rid of? You know, you've got to cut costs, you know, clearly you can't, you know. Um, and and I think you've, you know, 
it's hanging in the, you're, you're hanging in there. What are you hanging in there for? You're hanging in there for another chance. You're looking for another chance. You're looking for a, the next big thing. And um, those are, I think that's the, the two key things of how to survive is a cut, cut your costs so that you can survive as long as possible and equally be looking for the next big thing so that when it if you find something you can jump on it and quickly you know reposition or pivot you know get you know jump on the new on the next thing because what's gone what's your next thing how did you get to the next stage from a market store well so um different uh product i mean you know the product is the next big thing obviously you're in you know we're, we're in the we're selling products i mean you know it's fashion and you better keep an eye out for what's going on so at that time in the 80s in london you know street fashion was what drove everything the people buyers came to london really principally for our edgy street you know they street fashion for want of a better word but that was that was london's place in the in the fashion world you know what i mean like you know the images of paris or milan and london are completely different and you know we were very london as i said we we komodo grew out of acid house music so our friends and influences were djs and huge club nights and raves and you know very music related and london led, led the world in that and you know so it was clear who we are, who we were, and where you know what we were all about. And so real signature, but then you you must so. have yeah, been you know, and, the wholesale at, at one point. Well, so we started wholesaling pretty early, early on. Once um, you know, you know, I was wholesaling as soon as I started making jean jackets. My, you know, my first. You're gonna like this one. My first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we made this. We made the first sample was made on on my kitchen table with a bit of help from my mum um that we took down the east end and found a factory off just off kingsland road you know right off shoreditch um i think the first one that we made from the factory or maybe we made a, f a few anyway our first stop was camden market on the saturday and i sold three in one little shop stool shop kind of thing to a bunch of streety guys that had a little unit or a share of a unit and then that was the Saturday and then on the Sunday I went up to Wembley Market and we and we sold a few more up there and I think we went to Leather Lane or we went to Portobello you know we did the round you know sold a few more and by the end of the first week I'd gone to Oxford Street like the big time and and I think the week after that I went, I managed to blag an appointment to see the owner of a business called Gene Genie that you have to be my generation to remember. But the owner was a very uh, bullshy young man called Philip Green. And um, and I thought I told him I'm not leaving his office until he comes down to my car and buys a few jean jackets out the back of my little car. And to get rid of me, he did. And um, so he was my first sort of bigger, proper you know anybody that had more than one stall or one shop was philip green and um and i you know and we uh, you know and you're off and running and uh he, he was a character so you hustled oh. in a way you, you I hustled him. Really. yeah i hustled him yeah. Yeah, i guess he liked that because he was a hustler <laughs> himself i think he was better natured in those days i think he i think he's uh i don't know what happened to him i think he stopped having fun and uh <laughs> He and it's pretty nasty in the end, but um, you know, he was making his way, I was making my, yeah. But just, you know, I think the, the first lesson of trying to get yourself established, I mean, if we're talking to people trying to get going, and just don't take no for an answer, just I just don't, you know, he told me to fuck off and I don't want you in this crap in my show, and I just, just, I just wasn't gonna go until he tried them. So in the end, he did. I don't know if you can get away with that anymore, but you've got to be persistent. You've got to be, you've got to not take no for an answer. You've got to, you know, aim, aim at a decent target, but then really try and be persistent and make, you know, don't give in easily. You, you can't. Your, your products changed quite a lot since then. Um, yes, they have. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that the team has been instrumental 
yeah, in that. I mean, success is so often about yeah, we have proper around. fashion designers now. <laughs> how did you how did you find the people, bring the people around you who would help you grow? Well, of course, in those days we didn't have common objective, which made life quite <laughs> harder. <laughs> um actually at the beginning, so when I got going, um it was all my friends from school and their friends from college that was the original Komodo gang. Um, and I'm not sure that's a great way to start. I mean, it certainly meant we had fun, but he, employing your friends is a difficult thing to do. And uh, I don't know, it gave us a great, you know, it had its advantages. In those days, it definitely had its advantages. We were a big crew when we went out there were plenty of us, you know, we made an impact where, wherever we went and, you know, everybody knew about us and we did a lot of, um, not just kind of, um, you know, I'm thinking about really in Asia and in the factories where we used to go out there, but, you know, here in the UK, you know, we had, we, we had, we did start a Komodo stall in Camden market. We did have various other market stalls, but we did a lot of festivals. Um, we were doing Glastonbury from 1990, And other festivals, you know, WOMADs and all those kind of, you know, so we did a lot of meeting the public. I was, we were the first people in, in the, the first year of the Clothes Show Live. So, you know, so we like to kind of have a big gang of us meet the public head on. Um, and, you know, and, the, you know, the we were full of characters because I, because, yeah, basically we didn't have any professional people. They were all mates of mates and, you know, yeah. So um, that kind of, I, I suppose that did help to establish the name and a bit of a reputation. We threw a lot of parties. A lot of our friends were DJs. You know, it was it was a scene, definitely. Um, then we had to grow up eventually, and you eventually get to a point where things, you know, when it all takes a turn down, you're as oh, you know, like my friend, you know, now what do you do with all your friends when they've when it's not working anymore? So it, it, it's a risky thing to do, and. Um, so, you know proceed with great caution but um eventually you know we you know i looked for you know trying to recruit particularly in the design department people that knew what they were doing um you know an accountant you know you, some areas of the business you need proper people that know what you're doing what they're doing marketing is a bit of a mythical area where okay if you've got a, a lot of good spirit uh what one might call chutzpah you can you can go quite a long way with that and that, that can work quite well. A good salesperson just needs to be a good salesperson. You can learn the rest of it as you go along. Um, but yeah, you, you, you know, I think in technical areas, it's definitely advisable to get people that have had some training and know what they're doing and had preferably a bit of experience because experience definitely helps. And you can find those on Co now, of course. And now, exactly. I want to bring um, one of the questions in from one of our audience, um, mm -hmm. which is quite an interesting one. What are the three biggest changes you have witnessed in 30 years in ethical fashion? <laughs> uh, the biggest changes? Well, people don't laugh at you quite so much anymore. And that's a good change at the beginning. Um, they did come and laugh, you know, I mean, we were young and we were uh, um, colourful and um, um, definitely alternative compared to the rest of the industry. And people, you know, we had put buyers and people come and just to look at us and stand from a little distance across the aisle and point and laugh and, you know, and, you know, what do you, you know, what are you talking about? And. I remember the you remember that TV show, The Young Ones, and the, the character Neil and the Young Ones used to go and go, it's great line, this moppy head if he guy go, it's the environment, man. And everyone made fun of him. It was like a big joke. And um so was it was we it not really like helping you at that point? They just said, What are you talking about? What are you, you know, this is just nonsense. And generally we we were a bit of a joke, I think. <laughs> um and 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 we were pretty so much alone. there were very few other people talking about anything. Catherine Hamlet was a very political animal, and she um was raised her, you know, head with her, you know, it's great, just print save the whales on the t-shirt or you know, and she she got a good break when 
George Michael wore one of her T-shirts in his uh, video and and she did this slogan T-shirt thing and it was kind of political and so that, that was a different voice, if you like, from most everybody else in the, in the industry. Um, and then a bit later on, you know, Safia came along with and, and People Tree and she really mastered the art of talking about it and and really went much further than much further than me and you know going out to see farmers and the big you know really pushed the whole organic cotton story and she deserves a lot of credit for uh making ethical fashion into a thing that people recognized and you know she she's really good at putting that message out there um and I suppose, you know, once there was, you know, then, you know, then, you know, I kind of come to realize and there's a few others who came up from Germany and it's like, and it really was only then that I realized like, well, that, that's what we do. That's what I've always done. We, you know, they're, what they're, the, the, the hymn that they're singing from their hymn sheet is how we've, I've been doing it from the start, really. And that was because of the traveling background as a backpacker, very immersed, you know, it's not, you know, today, you know, I, you've got to remember in those days you there was no connect you know when you were out in I don't know you know India and Nepal and Indonesia and Burma and you, there's no contact with the outside world there was no no contact with the outside world. I mean or, or, you know virtually you'd go and get your post at the at the general post office if when you went to the capital city once every few months and that was kind of it. You know, you couldn't afford newspapers. They were really expensive. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go out and buy a newspaper, you know, if you could go to a five-star hotel and find one. Um, you, could, you, you know, you called your mum once a month for three minutes and that was it. There was no, you know, no... Would you no, say in no a way it's easier so, for, for somebody setting up now or are there other challenges you think and... and are the things that you think are an opportunity for people setting up now of sustainable brands, well, or growing know, sustainable brands? The, the op, you know, the opportunity is, you know, obviously the tools that are, are available to us are so much more now. I mean, I often I remember, as I said before, uh, to people, you know, the, I don't think I could have started Komodo out of Bali without the invention of the fax machine. The fax machine, which was new around that time, made it possible for us to communicate one pages worth of news a day <laughs> backwards and forwards because you could never you know you it was too expensive to think about calling long distance at some post office you know calling center um no such thing obviously no mobile phones no you know at the beginning actually the very beginning in, in nepal i used to use a, i used to go to a travel agents and use a telex machine <laughs> you know which was quite expensive but you know you could you know, they didn't have, you know, hadn't, the fax machine hadn't arrived in Nepal in, in 1989. So, you know, technology definitely helps along, along the way. But in a way that, so, but my experience, what I'm trying to say is my experience of um, um, the traveling thing and the sort of the empathy that you get with the people because you're so immersed with them and, and then the wanting to create things with them and spending the time to, you know, so all the early products were like really sitting in a in the various different factories that made garments or made yarn or made knit or made weaving or you know and like oh you know what how can i how can we turn your amazing but really a bit too ethnic and you know you know how do we turn that into something i can sell you know you know it's great what you do but it's not quite right for yeah shops in leeds and liverpool and milan and you know I, that's not going to work i've got to turn it into something that looks right for us and it's going to so you've got to know your market and you've got to figure out how to turn what you've got into what you what you need and um and it was great fun and it was a great puzzle and, and you know so all my friends that came out to help um you know you really spent so much time with these people solving problems figuring it out um the the yeah you, you the relationship was you know it was, it was really strong and I kind of miss that in a way now because we you know it, the world's mm -hmm. moved on and it isn't quite like that anymore and you know you can you can email each other 20 times a day and you know so um but but that was a lot of fun so you know I think having a I know you're going to ask me about uh, uh relations with suppliers but that that 
but you know it comes from my time I, I really if I hadn't have done that whole traveling thing I don't think I would have had the same feeling and relationship with the with the people and that's you know makes you want so to meeting in person I mean that is one of the most inspiring things I think about Komodo you've, you've got partnerships that have lasted years and really delivered quite a lot of meaningful change um so this leads me on to uh, the next question from one of our uh, one of our registrants I'm struggling to find a manufacturer and I really don't know what to do anymore and I'm tearing my hair out how do you find them and, that, and the, the, so this is somebody asking about manufacture how do you how do you build those partnerships and then we've also got a number of questions on finding sustainable fabric suppliers and making that relationship work mm. Um, well, so as far as the supplier goes, I would say, uh, so my experience, um, go where you want to be. I mean, you know, our production, you know, we, we still use the moniker Komodo, London, Bali, Kathmandu, because, you know, we're from, London is where we're from and where the ideas are from, but Bali and Kathmandu was where everything, where the things came from. And, you know, that was integral to our to, to who we were. And of course, it would have been much easier to work in Hong Kong and Turkey and Bangladesh or, you know, these kind of places. But no, 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 no. Like, you know, my backpack, my, you know, I fell in love with Bali and Kathmandu. And so that's where we wanted to be. And, you know, that was more important than, than saving a dollar fifty on a shirt or something, or, you know, so, so I think, you know, if you're going to go, if you're looking to establish yourself in the business and you're setting up a business and you, you, you know, this is going to take a lot of your time, this is going to be your career, be work where you want to be, you know, there's no point in starting up making in China if you don't want to be there or don't want to, you know, if you really don't, yeah, I think try to be where you want to be because you're going to probably be there quite a lot. Uh, I mean, Corona has taught us all how to do things remotely, but hopefully that's behind us. And in normal times, you know, it's definitely better to go, you know, I mean, the, the, the fashion is, it's, we've only got two real seasons a year if you do it this way, the way, you know. So you've got time, there is time, you know, get out there. And of course, how to find a manufacturer is go and see a few and see who you get along with. I mean, you're going to have problems along the way. You're going to have to solve those problems. You better be working with someone that you, you know you're quite comfortable with solving the problems because uh you know death taxes and problems in the rag trade are the only <laughs> things guaranteed at home. and what does what's a great supplier partnership look like for you what's your sort of best experience of working with a supplier uh I mean, on, you know, honesty is the pretty valuable commodity. It's not, you know, even some of the ones I've been working with for years, they can't help themselves. They still try and hide things if things are not going well, you know. But really, you need them. To, you need to know when there's a problem coming along. What can we do about it? You know, how flexible can we be on our side? How, what can they do on their side? So it, you need a good, honest, um, you know, transparent, you know, that's really important. I think um, you've got, you know, problems are guaranteed, you know, don't, we, we don't get any, hardly any less problems today than we had all those years ago. You know, you know, you think you get smarter and you can preempt things, but there's just something else that comes along, you know. So you're going to have a lot of problems and the relationship in a good in a good supply relationship situation is when they're honest and they tell you and you can try and manage the time because the time factor is absolutely vital and, you know, and use money as well as you can. You know, it, you know, I think, you know, the, the, it's really important to pay people as well as you can, as helpfully as you can. Um, because that helps save them time and uh, time in the end is, is, is really what you need. You want to be giving as much time as you can to your shops and retailers to sell the stuff. So, um, you know, uh, you know, talk about sustainable business. The first rule of sustainability is paying your bills, um, you know, so that, that you know, that you pass the ball down the line and they can, they can get on with their thing. But um, 
that's you know good good communication is is really vital we're getting some great questions through on the chat and i just wanted to also flag up so co is a network our goal is to match up brands and suppliers so i'm sure you can it's worth having a look on co we work really hard to try and create some of the amazing suppliers out there and just flagging up that we've got a message from Ramesh De Silva in the in the chat offering help for Sri Lanka. Ramesh, if you're not already on Co, please do create a profile for your business. If you put your pop your link into the chat, I'll give you a bit more promotion. Um, we're keen to help use the Co platform so that users can build those relationships because it's not always easy to go out and visit everybody. And it helps also, I think, to make an initial connection before you do so. Um, some of our suppliers are even more forward thinking than many of our brands. They're really pushing the boundaries when it comes to best practice. And then one, one other, regenerative agriculture. So this is, it's, there's more and more interest around it. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that, Mark. What's the question? Regenerative, regenerative uh, uh, agriculture and regenerative production. Is it something you're looking at, or any of your suppliers are getting involved with? What does that mean? Regenerative Regen cotton. Ah, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Charles because this question is actually to Charles. Charles, please answer that in the chat, and I'll bring it up later. <laughs> We've got the expert. Um, so, does that mean cotton in transition? So Sorry. cotton. So it's an approach to cotton that um, supports soil biodiversity and soil health. So it's sort of the next step on from organic cotton, um, where. There are, there are limits to organic cotton because it's quite, you, you need to, uh, there, there's a limit to, it takes a while to become organic certified. Yeah. Um, and regenerative Going through three, three years, is it, of transition? But I think they can get, yeah. um, they can get certified for that. And you can buy certified in transition, the fields that are in transition, crops that are in transition. Um, and I, it, it would be helpful if it got more, profile i mean when i get questions about the farming i've got to be honest you know i don't go to the farms and although i know safi has famously done it on a couple of you know, on a few occasions you know we're a fashion design brand i you know you know I, I, I maybe i could have maybe i should have but you know we don't go to the farms that grow the cotton it's a whole nother um level of you know depth and there's only so much that you can really do and i and i think to sustain your own as i say the most important thing to sustain is your own business you you know you, you can't be preaching and uh you know you, we i if i'm going to start getting involved in how the farmers grow the stuff or what you know then I don't know. That just sounds like a really time-consuming, demanding. Thing. I <laughs> I'd go, prefer I go and turn up, and, to... you know, kiss some babies and, and put some flowers on. But that's not going to do any use. Do you know what I mean? There are a few people in the industry that I do know that that really have a good knowledge of this, but I can't claim to be one of them. And refer refer people to Cressy Westling, our last. Um, session. She's sort of become a farmer, but yeah, well, that's lovely, and, and you know, and, yeah. and that <laughs> I, that could be great, but I haven't really, you know, I've got. You're focused on the product, which means I'm focused on the product and the market and the factories and just juggling all of that along with the teenager. That's that's you know, I'm pretty full with that, and that's what the certifying. That's what GOTS is for. That's what the, all the certifications on the, the things are for. We collect, you know, we we buy certified fabrics and work with certified factories so that the certifying bodies whom we pay that you know it's not a free service um does that checking and does you know we have to have faith in them and then you know we're in a chain everybody's got to have faith in each other down the line you know the shopkeeper sure. that you know opens the shop on your high street you know has to have faith in us and you know and you you have faith in your in your local shop and you ask them you know, oh, this says it's organic. How do you know? Or, you know, whatever, you know, where's some verification? And they rely on us and we rely on our fabrics and suppliers as well. And they rely on their, you know, they're not, you know, the, the guy that makes the knitwear isn't spinning the yarn and the guy that's, you know, buying the fabric isn't weaving the fabric or, you know, so 
there has to be we're in a chain we're all linked together we you can't do everything and um you know even though as i say a few fashion designers can go and out to see the farmers in bangladesh and stand in the fields and whatever you know it's a great it's a good photo opportunity and, and it, it is useful to link the whole thing up and i made your clothes is great you know when you see the cotton farmers and whatever doing it and you know you know that's the value of buying organic cotton is that we believe and it is so it is checks out that those guys have a better deal that they're avoiding yeah. the horrible chemicals that they're getting a fair wage that they're you know they're given some dignity and th 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 it works and that they're happy doing it and that's why i wouldn't you know we buy organic cotton and we wouldn't buy not organic cotton unless maybe this in in transition cotton because that would be helpful um but i think it's i think it's for the um certifying bodies to raise the profile of in transition cotton to a better level because it isn't really out there and it would be great to have a bit cheaper Mm. Tea, you know products that's in transition that we all feel like well you know okay it's not organic but it's on the way to becoming so and that would be a really useful thing for a better price point products um you know because there is a lot of demand now for organic products and the high you know as the multiples in the high street are getting involved you know their place is is to do that i know that super dry are using a lot of uh in transition cotton i don't know if they're talking about it as much you know i think i think because in the public eyes it's either organic or it's not as i say i think it's it's the job of those certifying bodies or somewhere in the media to raise the profile of in transition crops um cotton being the main one obviously um to help that journey because that that would be really useful but it's that it's a more convoluted message that I, you know i'm not sure small brands well we could I mean, it's not saying we can't of course we could but it would be Watch out. this space. We'll be doing more yeah. on yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm up for, I'm open, I'm definitely open to Thanks that. for yeah. the comments in the chat. We um yeah. there's uh, yeah, there's a, a, a complex um set of issues to consider and many opportunities. But we've had a few questions through about GOTS, um yeah. Mark, and yeah. how you know at what point you became GOTS registered how you manage to make that work with your, because there are some costs associated with it. How, how have you made that work with your model? And obviously you see the value in doing that. Um, at what point did you do that? What joined gods? Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, something like that. I can't, they'll tell you, I'm not really sure. Something like that. Um, I think once it became, the leader of the pack if you like and we understood clearly what they did and how important it was to convey but I think we were being asked for more proof I mean as I say because we you know because we've been doing this so long and because I feel like you know you know I mean, we do say the original you know I feel like I've been doing this pretty longer than almost anybody else and and most of our customers know that. Most of the shops that we deal with know that. But of course, you know, you're you're conveying to the consumer and the new generation don't know, don't know anything about, you know, the old stories. And um, so it became more important to, to demonstrate that how we were doing things and, you know, and that we were authentic. And I think particularly, actually, I suppose more, more like the the Europeans, you know, the Swiss and the Germans who are a bit more pedantic and, you know, want some, yeah, where is your certificate? Okay, we better, we better get some certificates. So we join, you know, we weren't the first to join uh, join some of these organizations. That's for sure. We we're probably a bit late coming to the party, if, if truth be told, because we just sort of felt like, well, we Komodo, everybody knows. But we, um, you know, it was time to, yeah, you know, and what they're doing is good. And the only way you can support it is by joining. So, um you know quite a while ago but you know I think you, you need you know there are a lot of certificates out there and you can you can get a bit obsessed with it and you know maybe overcook it a bit and um you know there were some things that we joined that were didn't really help I remember what was that Dutch one called Do you remember that with the blue button made by Do you remember yes that? so we were members of made by for like five years and I was paying and it because like it was bills quarterly and it was it was didn't seem that much 
But then I realized like after five years, I'd paid them like 20 grand or something. Wow. It's just like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, and they, they promised to like be the big high profile public, yeah. have all the, you know, we're going to be conveyed. Oh, everybody's going to know it's going to be famous. You know, you're going to be one of the yeah. you know, original members and, you know, and you, you're busy day to day. You just don't really think about it. And eventually I kind of like, whoa, hang on a minute. I've really wasted some. So, you know, you can't be a member of everything. You can't be have every certificate and join, but, you know, GOTS is definitely important and, you know, and so is Common Objective, obviously. <laughs> obviously. Um, so moving on. So we, we're, I knew this would happen. We, we don't have enough time. We've got 15 minutes left and I feel like we've only just started, but I'd really like to move into product because... Um, oh, look, I can see a thing from Fiona McLaughlin on, um, on your chat thing. The global gypsy. Yeah. I, I'm reading the chats now. <laughs> yeah, we have some brilliant people in the room. Um, I remember yeah. the global gypsy. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, where were we? So ju just looking at a product and how it's changed and, and just trying to get to the bottom of what makes best-selling products stand out. What have you learned over the years? And kind of relevant to this question also, is something that's popped up in quite a few questions from our visitors signing up and in the chat just now weaving your philanthropy weaving the kind of values into building your brand and the product was that from the very beginning or did that come in as you grew weaving how important so the the concept of the brand being about giving back about the you know the the products the people you support um i suppose that kind of comes from the product the was that, that always there from the beginning Pretty much, yeah. Um, if I had to kind of date it, I'd say, I think one from the, from the Nepalese side and and the Tibetan story, and one of my earliest poems. I used to write little poems and put them on all the hang all the hang tags, and I did one about the Tibetans being the most favoured nation. It was a sort of jab at the <laughs> Chinese um, quota system and the MFN most favoured nation status. That Could you keep asked. copies of those? We should post those up in the. Uh, in the no, I'm not. I'm not a good um, curator <laughs> of things, but there is stuff. There is some things, but but um, I, yeah, I think you know one. I've got a long term love affair with Tibetan things and uh, and. Um, I think so yeah wanting to contribute a bit and, and the free to bet campaign started um from very close to our office a guy called Robbie Barnett um and we I don't know how we met or we maybe festivals or something and I'm used to seeing him in Kathmandu now and again and um anyway you know you know I mean we were doing well at the beginning we you know you go through phases where you're doing really well and actually as a business, you know, one of the dangers in a way is, you know, when you've kind of made some money or you've got more than you're used to, you're like, oh, what should we do with it? You know, you, you know, you feel like you've got to put it to some use or whatever. So um, I think probably the helping out, contributing to Tibetan related things was where it started. And then, and then you realize people like that, you know, of course people respond well to that. I think, you know, again, being with the public at, festivals particularly where you've got time to talk to people um, um and people like to talk a lot at festivals um you you know you get the feedback and you go yeah you know and you of course you feel like it's a good thing and you know you're so you know now it's a very common thing brands align themselves with good causes and and you know good you know i mean that's you know i, I the whole thing you know like as I say people used to stop and laugh at us and now it's a whole now there's like an industry and you know we, we did a t-shirt a few seasons ago that a little peace sign and they said we're all hippies now you know it's just yeah, like brilliant yeah you know the, because there was none of that really I mean like the industry was just dominated by big jeans companies that yeah I suppose it's a virtuous circle isn't it create a great product that's selling you're promoting values through it you're able to give more back because it's successful. So the ultimate is to create a really great product that's going to fly off the shelves and have an impact. And is there are there commonalities? You know, are there elements of success where you can say, okay, that product was great, and this is why. Or when you create a product that really works, is there something that we can learn from that for others in the room? 
well you've got to get all the stars <laughs> to align really i mean a great yeah. product that sells really well is is in my i mean everything's got to be right you've got to have a great fabric it's got to be in great colors it's got to be a great cut it's got to be a good price the price is really important things mm sell really well at this price and not so well at this price and trying to feel that to get that right and you know if you're lucky enough that you know things get seen and you know something becomes really noticeable and you, and you really get up to a bigger scale then people want it because they've seen somebody else wearing it that's then you get a snowball kind of effect and if you get to the world of celebrities where celebrities wear things and you get a credit then that has a great effects and some brands spend a lot of energy trying to chase that uh you know that goal um but yeah a great product is everything is right the, you know you you know if the if if you if the, you make something and it's a bit it's nice but it's a bit expensive it's highly unlikely to be a great seller if the yeah it's nice but strange color mm, that's not, you know, it's got to be perfect if it doesn't fit very well. You know, it looks good, but it doesn't, you know, people try it on, but then they put it back. So that, you know, so to get it all right, it's got to have real good hanger appeal. You know, nowadays you've got to do some good marketing to, to go with it, good images and so forth. The shopkeepers have got to go, yeah, you know, be excited and buy two dozen instead of one dozen or, you know, a dozen instead of half a dozen and, you know, get behind it a bit, do three colors instead of one color. And then it's people got to take it off the rail and try it on and say, yeah, I want that, you know, so everything's got to be just right for it to be a real good. A real so when winner. you've got that blank sheet of paper and you you're, you know, you're designing the next season, mm. what goes into that? Is that, is that, you know, is there a bit of zeitgeist, a little bit of, um, Guesswork. Uh, well, I got to be honest. I don't. I don't, I don't I've got a little design team now, so they, <laughs> they start with a blank bit of paper, uh, more more than I do these days. But um, you 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 know, a brand's got to have a bit of continuity. I mean, you you can't just reinvent yourself entirely from one season to the next. You you've got to have a look over the years and decades. In my case, you know, of course we've evolved and acid house and street fashion and grunge fashion and all of this has gone by the wayside really and it's just in the archives but so you've got to be contemporary but gradually and you know and you we keep our best selling styles you know do it in a new color change the fabric but you know keep yeah. the good cuts keep the good uh fits you know keep trying you know keep the good you know keep refresh you know refresh you could, it's it's a huge work to design an entirely new collection every season you know and keep the business uh efficient you know you, you know how many people do you want to employ it's it's expensive and uh you know so you know you've got to manage your resources and you know and if you want to donate and and contribute things to um other good causes along the way and build that into your you know model as well then you know that's you know maybe you might not employ that extra assistant and that extra marketing person and that extra because you know, you know what? It's better. I mean, better people. You know, everybody works hard and is busy and gets on with it. In the early days, we were so busy. I mean, we had a lot of fun. It was great. It was all my mates. But oh my god, we worked like Trojans. Yeah. You know, really. You know, from the from the start. You know, late into the night every day. Very rarely. You know, weekends. What was that? You know, hard. You know, my. Yeah. We, you know, we did party, we did have a great time, but we really, really worked hard. I can't maintain that. You know, you get tired eventually. You can't do it forever. Um, but um, it's okay for the team to work hard, at least for a for a while. And, you know, that's a much better, you know, than like, oh, you know, we're going to have to lay somebody off. We can't, you know, we can't sustain this anymore. It's not really working. Oof, that's ugly, you know, and, and it's difficult to, when you're in that position to have to do that. It's a, it's a, you know the dark side of running a business if, if you like and um so we're, you know, we're be running honest, out of time just just less than 10 minutes and I wanted to make sure that we get to some of the real impact you've had mm -hmm. and I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the groups you support and also the activist club um do you want to share a bit about what that is and how how it works and and we've had we've had a lot of interest in the chat around how you 
make that difference through your business? Well, listen, I mean, uh, um, so, you know, I, I don't want to take more plaudits than we're worth. We do contribute um, to um, the various things that we're involved with, principally the SOS, the Orangutan Society, so March and Orangutan Society, uh, who are, um, um, was started by a, a, an old friend of mine, and it is a um, forest in Sumatra that they continue to expand and grow and buy the land around and develop uh, a safe home for the orangutans who live in a forest with tigers and rhinoceros and um, yeah it's an amazing uh, ecosystem and they and we try and <clears throat> and, and it is supported to grow and that is a great thing for us to support and we do that um but you know, I don't. Feel, I, you know, I kind of feel like we don't really do enough. I mean, you know, when you look, when we look up the scale and see companies like Patagonia, um, you know, who really perform miracles and are you know major, um, you know, and they're sort of massively different scale to us. But you know, you've got to do what you can afford to, you know, what you can afford to do, and you know, and it, and it's better to be to play slightly within yourself and then be in a position to go. Actually, we can do a bit more now. Um, which are kind of is our position maybe about now, but, you know, but, but now look where we are, you know, you, were, you know, th these times are dangerous times. So we've sort of built up a little bit of reserve and you're thinking, well, I kind of feel like we really should be donating, you know, giving a bit more, maybe we can do a bit more than we did before. And then you, you know, you're going, well, uh, you know, you know, just hold your, hold your powder dry a little bit because you don't know what's coming around the corner. So, you know, these are, you know, you've got to take these decisions at some point, but um, we do a bit. I don't think we do anything extraordinary. I don't, I don't feel like we're massively generous. We, you know, I'd say I'd like to do a bit more, you know, I think we, we do, we support the, um, the Tibetan village up in, um, in Nepal, where we've uh, helped build uh, schools and um, I say long, you know, I've got decades of uh, association and we've been involved in building of lots of schools um in their community and we do other things as well um, and all coming to mind but um you know Frankly, I, I think if if the fashion industry did as much as you did we would be in a very different place although I think everybody should do something definitely yeah. everyone should do something and um you know, in our little <laughs> eco world maybe more more are I know thoughts do a lot and um, you know, and some brands sing about it a bit more than others. And, but I think it's totally legitimate you know, and, uh, to, to, to tell your public what you're doing and to ask your public to support you a little bit. And I think the public that buy your products want to know that you're contributing something and what you're doing. And, and uh, you know, they're a part of that. Obviously, we couldn't do it if they didn't buy anything, you know. So we try, you know, we have tried over the years, like, well, um, you know, we, you know, you, I mean, we've just made a Ukraine, a uh, couple of Ukraine print T-shirts, you know, obviously where we're giving all of the profit to the um, charity that looks that helps to look after uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, in Poland. And, you know, you know, I mean, you know, just nail your colours to the mast if you if you can, um, even if it's controversial and difficult. I mean, you know, the, you know, obviously I, we do make things in China and I do support Tibetans and that is you know, I do worry about going to China. It's been a while since I've been because of Corona. And I'm, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you, you, we face a lot of difficult questions about China. Um, but we've got this amazing lady in China who just does such a great job for us. And, you know, you to, to, to run a, an eco brand, I kind of almost defy you to do it without buying anything from China. It's mm -hmm. almost impossible. They, they, you know, we used to ship all the fabrics from from China to Nepal. We used to fly them because because the transport is so bad across land. It was the only way to do it, and we were spending all this money on air freight. And then, you know, the the the, the carbon footprint of that was really bug bothering me because I didn't want to make anything in China, but the fabrics were coming from China. So I was like, this is really contradictory. And and then, you know. I got introduced by a fabric supplier to a garment maker and then we went over to see her and found this lovely brilliant lady with her family and friends that were all running this uh small factory big workshop you know whatever great fun people having a you know really 
having a good time and you know sustaining themselves and having this good little business and we were a perfect fit for each other and so okay you know I'm, I can't keep apologizing for doing that it's it fits and it works and you know that's how it goes but um you know supporting supporting good causes I think is a obligation of businesses generally that you know if you can afford to you should and people for that matter Thank you. So we're, we're in the final countdown now. I just wanted to flag up. Um, Co is a network about connecting and we've got a message from Fonny Benjamin in the chat. Thank you, Fonny. So I wanted to flag this up to your attention, Mark. Bestis Labs. Fonny, why not connect with Mark on, on Co? Um, so it sounds like you're doing some good stuff. Um, a final word from you, Mark, on... Um, your biggest learnings or your biggest learning if there's one or two tips you would give people who are you know trying to grow their brand trying to make it sustainable and drive impact at the same time what would it be Ooh, um i don't know you got me there uh <laughs> so if, so if you want to run a sustainable brand then just you know don't look at non-sustainable fabrics it's not that difficult we just choose from the ones that are you know that are good you know we, we don't look at stuff that if you know if it's if it's not sustainable fabric then we just don't really look at it um and you know there's so there's plenty of choice it's not like there's you know there's, there's more than enough choice and things you can make and you find yourself a good maker that can make things that you get along with and you know, communicate with and you know and if they've got a good certification then great and if they haven't then they haven't it's not the end of the world they can build up to it and get there but it costs them money and it's quite a work for them to do it and I won't you know I don't so I won't buy a fabric if it's not got some eco credentials more or less got a certificate but definitely it's got to be clearly a good fabric to it's got it has a good impact in the, in its own making factories in making you know make up things that's different if 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 it's got a certificate great if it hasn't but you've you've been there and you've seen and you know and you feel like yeah okay look these are good people there's nothing there's nothing bad to see here this is this is a decent operation then okay you know and get on with it and you know i don't think we should be religiously tied to everything being being certified but you've got to know yourself um and there's tons of stuff you can make and you know just you know find your signature find your handwriting find your market you know what can you sell what sh who what shops can you sit in comfortably and belong in you've got to belong in these shops and the shops in our model of wholesaling is that is the lifeblood of the thing i guess today in the sort of you know everything being e you know on an e-commerce basis oof, i don't know it's not really my world but um you know we, we we do all right and it's a good you know it's definitely an important part of of, of the whole story now um but i don't know it's it's all clicks and I don't know how to relate to it very well and you know we, we shops I understand and going to see a shop you know pretty quickly whether that shop's suitable for you to sit in or, or not you know do you belong there or not and and then build up from there because there's generally lots of other ones like them you've just got to find them Thank you so much. I feel like we're only just getting started, but perhaps we can continue the conversation. Yeah, we can um, continue in the pub if you like that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a great idea. We could do with some more physical events, getting people together again. So we'll work on that. Yes, funny enough, I had a call about one today. I'll tell you about it later. So. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I invite you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a few things to flag up for our audience. We have another fireside chat coming up on the 29th of June which is with Perry Drysdale, the founder and CEO of Untouched World, who are the first business to be formally accredited by the UN as a, you know, extremely committed to sustainability best practice. And I also just wanted to remind people that we've got some incredible new features on Co that you may not have um, come across yet. We've talked a lot about fabrics and sourcing. We have a new capability on Co, Co called CoCreate, which allows you in a few minutes to post what it is you want. It's a very visual process. Um, specify what fabric you're interested in. And that then creates a project which suppliers can respond to. So instead of you having to do all the, re all the search, all the work to find exactly who you're looking for, um, they will come to you, especially good if you've got you know, challenging things you're looking for. 
notice board we're, we're getting a lot more traction for that if you're looking for people to build your team if you've got events if you've got a new product if you're a supplier and you want to get out there um, you can post on the code notice board um, and you can also as a supplier respond to brands requests on co-create and finally co-credits that's those are training um, credits so if you're, you may be an individual looking for work in the sector, you may be a business looking to represent what your team has done around sustainability. Um, we know that the kind of core concept behind common objective is that it should turn sustainability from a cost to an opportunity. So if you're taking the time to upskill yourself or your team, you should benefit from it. And the way co-training credits work is that if you or any of your team have completed a credit, you have a, an email course, you complete a short quiz at the end, you then get a credit stamp that shows on your business profile and raises your business profile ranking. So we're getting a lot of engagement by that with that from suppliers. Um, and you can access, you can access a lot, a lot of information on Co as a, as a free user, but if you upgrade from $19.99 a month, you can access all of this detail and you can promote your business and we have brand leaders coming up so this is just these chats with individuals heading up change in the industry are just a precursor to what we're looking for at later in the year with our flagship event where we'll be sharing best practice with some of the most inspiring people in the fashion industry and across the world um, so also to remind you we are recording this session and we'll keep it uh, we'll put that up on Co. You can also save the chat if you want to save the answers to questions. Um, and we will be trying to, so we've got, so we have some really interesting things brought up in the chat, especially the organic regenerative conversation. Um, we'll look to find ways to open that up to, to our community and get more debate happening there. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming in and hope to see you at the next one and hope to see you on Co. You can connect with anybody who's come into this session. If you want to continue the conversation, you can message them and connect on code.